About 80% of the conversations that I have on the topic of non-functional requirements contains a moment where one of us says, I hate the term non-functional requirements. That's because it's a stupid term that really, really misses the point almost completely. So what are non-functional requirements? Why do they matter anyway if they're non-functional? And how should we deal with what are actually often the trickier parts of software development? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. The term NFR gets deeply under the skin of some people and doesn't seem to bother others at all. I'm in the first camp. I think that NFR is a dumb description that misses everything interesting and important about these attributes of our systems. And let's not mistake this. These are things that really, really matter a lot. Wikipedia defines non-functional requirements like this. A requirement that specifies criteria that can be used to judge the operation of a system rather than a specific behavior. I really don't see this distinction. If I'm building a trading system, for example, one of the requirements may be that I can reliably and repeatably respond within a fixed, usually very small, period of time. This is not a quality of the system that is separate in some way. This is a fundamental behavior or need, the kind of behavior that will define success or failure for this kind of software system. So for systems like these, something like a maximum latency of one millisecond is as real a business requirement as being able to place an order. There's nothing non-functional about this requirement. I can say the same for security requirements. If you're building software that processes other people's money, the security of that money and the means of payment matters a lot. If you ignore security or sideline it because these things are non-functional, uh, then how will your users react when their credit card is cleaned out because you let these details leak out to the dark web? Again, making sure these details are safe sounds like the kind of function that our customers would value to me. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfic. All these companies offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, then click on the links in the description to below to check them out and to support them. So clearly, non-functional requirements aren't non-functional at all. Ideas like security, responsiveness, resilience, and so on are often things that our users value very highly indeed. In fact, things that they may even use to differentiate between different products when choosing which one to use. For example, I'm a Mac user. That's at least partly because of what, if we are being lazy, we may think of as the non-functional aspects of this ecosystem. This is not because of any individual feature of my Mac as much as about something more pervasive. There's a general approach to usability, security, resilience, and so on that work well for me. I think that touches on something important that maybe starts to clarify the confusion around non-functional requirements. Something much more definitional about the real differences and that is not that one is functional and the other is not. But that one set of requirements are atomic, individual, easily identifiable, easy to compartmentalize and the others aren't. If you have a requirement, a user story that says something like respond in under one millisecond, how do you estimate, plan, implement, and deploy that? The real difference here is that the term non-functional is actually a kind of code for the fact that these kinds of features are cross-cutting, things that aren't defined or implemented in a single place in the code. They are broad brush properties of the whole or a significant part of the system. You probably don't have a resilient or secure system if one part is not resilient and another is not secure. So these aspects of the systems that we create are much more difficult to deal with. I think that calling them and thinking of them as non-functional does them an important disservice. 
and is reasonably common source of problems in teams that think of them in this way. I guess this boils down to, to some extent, what's in a name. Who cares what we call these things? They're just labels, right? Well, the problem is that human language is fraught with meaning. And if we use terms like functional and non-functional, isn't it fairly obvious which one people would value more? Especially if they don't already have the additional context necessary to understand that actually the non-functional things are often more important and more difficult problems to solve than the functional things. I can write a social media system or a web-based bookshopping application in less than a week if it only needs to serve a few hundred people and doesn't need to be resilient, secure, scalable, auditable and so on. And yet, it's taken Amazon, Twitter, Facebook and companies like them years to get their systems to the state that they're at now. Why is that? It isn't because they've added more and more new functional features. That really isn't the hard part. It is all of that non-functional stuff that makes this a genuinely difficult problem to solve. The kind of problem that we can only solve by trying stuff out and seeing what really works. I guess that the difference in the amount of work between a simple functional only version and a real world whole system is orders of magnitude of more effort on the non-functional side. So if a naive, perhaps non-technical person is put in charge of planning, what are they going to hear? Dave says he can work and build this feature in a few weeks if we ignore all of that non-functional stuff. And clearly, if it's non-functional, it can't be as important as the functional stuff, right? So let's just prioritise that. In the real world, you'll probably not find the people making planning decisions quite that naive. But many organisations come close. Don't worry about testing. Don't worry about scalability. Don't worry about maintainability. Let's just get it out there. And as long as we think about these vital aspects of our system being non-functional, thinking and conversations like this are probably inevitable. Because after all, it's easier for all of us to imagine someone doing the work to add a button to post a message than it is to make that message available to everyone on the planet who may be interested as fast as possible. So we can estimate with some degree of accuracy the first of these, and no one on the planet can accurately predict how long it will take to fix the second one. As long as we think in these kinds of terms for planning purposes, we will try and avoid the hard problems by giving the stuff that we don't really understand properly stupid names like non-functional requirements. By referring to these things as non-functional requirements, we're hiding from the reality of software development, the part that makes it difficult. But that's only one part of the problem with NFRs. More importantly, how do we tackle these very complicated cross-cutting parts of our systems? Fundamentally, as ever, this is an issue of system design. I have a new free how-to guide on how to avoid some of the commoner software development pitfalls. It's really good, so do check out the link in the description below if you'd like to take a look. These cross-cutting requirements need us to think about them every time we touch the code. This is so daunting that we would be idiots to design our system in, in a way that forces everyone to think like this in detail for every change. Uh, but these things are complicated and slippery. So in reality, I'd suggest that the answer comes in kind of three parts. Model, compartmentalize and assert. We need to model our current understanding using the techniques of managing complexity, design our system to keep it easy to change as we learn more. Start by designing it as though it was a small, simple system. Focus on satisfying the basic user need. But where you can, do that in a way that defers decision-making on the details particularly the details of the non-functional requirements. This is a fairly nuanced approach. What we're really trying to achieve is to think enough about what might be difficult in the future so that we can insulate ourselves from it, allowing us to make progress without solving all of these problems now. This does involve a little bit of crystal ball gazing. What if this, what if that, and so on, to help us build a, a, a mental model to test our high level imagined picture of the system. But the techniques of managing complexity allow us to do this without relying 
too much on the accuracy of our crystal ball. What we'd like is just enough information to imagine where to begin to draw the lines to compartmentalize our system in some way and also how to abstract conversations in a way that we can keep the compartments reasonably separate. Until that is, we learn enough to see where we get any of this stuff wrong. This compartmentalization can, by design, help us to defer decisions about the non-functional parts of the system so that we don't need to think about their implementation detail every time we make a change. The second part of this strategy, though, is kind of cultural. I think that what we want to establish in this compartmental approach comes in two parts. Use design so we don't need to worry about all of the details all of the time, but also establish a good enough picture of these important non-functional qualities of our system in the mind of every developer so that if they come across something unusual or challenging, they can check it against their current mental model and so maybe spot where our current versions of these abstractions begin to break down. Then we can figure out how we should change things to work better. This is the working model of the system that needs to change and grow all of the time. A whiteboard model is a useful tool to help shape that kind of thinking and those kinds of discussions. But more broadly, we should just keep talking about the design. It needs to be a living thing. The other thing that can help us to spot when our assumptions are wrong is to assert them. Clearly, this takes the form of tests. So, if your system today processes 100 users and you expect it one day to work for 1,000, write the test today that verifies that it works for 100. When you're ready to grow it to cope with 1,000, use the test to see what happens when you do. So let's imagine replacing something like Twitter again. In terms of performance and scalability, we can imagine that even if we are building a small, simple version right now, one day we may need more. One of the features that we want is to populate a user's timeline with messages, with things that they're interested in. We could decide to create some code that represents a user and simply send all messages to every user and then filter them and discard the ones that users don't care about. That would be a relatively easy place to start writing the code maybe for the user and would probably work for small numbers of users. But if every user sees every message, my guess is that this isn't going to scale very well. And I think that I wouldn't start by writing it like that. Instead, we could think of this as being two separate problems. We have a list of stuff that the user is interested in, and we have to deal with all of the messages so that we can build a timeline of messages for each user of the things that they're interested in. If we are successful, our hope is that someday the second group is going to be a fire hose of millions, maybe billions of messages, vast amounts of information. This part of the system may one day become very, very complicated indeed. So we have no idea how to solve that problem yet. The other part, the user's preferences, who they are following, um, who's following them, these are different. Mostly, only the user themselves are interested in these things. So we could imagine a system that was basically, for this part of the problem, relatively simple. Each user has some dedicated storage, a shard of some kind, tied to them, uh, where we keep all that stuff relevant to them. If you want to support more users, add more storage. These are very different kinds of scaling problems. And that is all we need to know right now if our aim is to keep our options open. Make these two parts of the user experience a little bit separate by design. Creating accounts and storing the feed of messages are separate, distinct parts and features of the system. This is just a separation of concerns and so good design. But separation of concern informed a little bit by thinking about some of these non-functional properties. Now, However complicated the problems of dealing with the fire hose and the problems of enormous popularity with millions of users may become, they are at least a little bit distinct from one another. We can find out where these choices don't work out later, and because our system is compartmentalised, it will be easier to change than if it wasn't. Thank you very much for watching. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who help us to make this channel possible. 
If you'd like to join them, you can sign up for a free trial. The details of that are in, uh, in the description below. Thank you again.